Okay, so you've been staring at this slide here for a few minutes, probably wondering why are there people riding bikes? Um, I happen to really love bicycles and we're in Amsterdam, so it seems sort of fitting to use this image to say that accessibility is about people. The people in this image are, there's one uh, or two vision impaired people and Elle Waters, who's piloting a tandem bicycle. Steve Sassen, who's blind, is sitting behind her we did a, an activity where we paired uh, visually impaired people with sighted people and we went for a tandem bike ride and it was awesome. And the, the experience for me as a cyclist, having a blind person sitting behind me talking about how free she felt as we rode this tandem bike through San Diego, to me this is what accessibility is all about. You don't always have a blind person sitting behind you saying, this is awesome, thank you for making this accessible. But people are always there and they always need us to make websites and web applications that are accessible so that we're supporting them even when they're not sitting behind our shoulder. You are here, the few of you who came, to uh, listen to me, Marcy Sutton, talk about accessible AngularJS. I'm from Seattle in the US where I'm an accessibility engineer. I'm actually joining Adobe when I get home at a new position. But I'm also an Angular core team member and for the past 10 or 11 months, I've been working on Angular material design um, at, a, at a company where I was a contractor, essentially. But I've been working on accessibility in Angular for almost a year now. So today you're going to hear me talk about accessibility challenges in Angular, in material design, and all the things that I've picked up in the past year. My slides are online at marcysutton.com slash gotocon. Uh, they're also on GitHub and they're in the footnote of my slides so you can access them at any time. Accessibility in Angular does not have the best track record, I will admit, and this is why I got into it, was because accessibility with Angular applications has been pretty dismal. Part of the community opinion of Angular was that it was pretty terrible for accessibility, to be quite honest. I have a tweet from my colleague, Paul Adam. He's holding up an image of a textbook on Angular it's got a simple HTML template with some form controls in it, but he's calling out that AngularJS web apps are never accessible because even the books on it start with inaccessible examples. Same is true with the docs. Uh, there's countless blog posts out there where if you're showing something that's JavaScript specific, maybe you're not going to spend all the time to make your HTML accessible, but what happens as a byproduct of that is that you are talking about anti-patterns for accessibility. And so each anti-pattern that makes it into a blog post or into a textbook shows the person writing the JavaScript that that's an okay practice. So over time, all of these examples have built up to a culture of inaccessible web applications. But that made an opportunity. I, I saw an opportunity to make it better and improve accessibility of Angular applications. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. A little bit about how I got into Angular. Um, I mentioned it was, I saw an opportunity and I wanted to make accessibility better in Angular. Um, through being loud on Twitter, I actually was invited to speak at NG Europe last fall and through that engagement is sort of in a, in a nutshell how I became involved with the Angular team and they invited me to work on Angular material full time. So I've been working on open source as a contractor um, my last day on that was two weeks ago, so it's still very fresh in my mind. Today we're going to talk about material design and accessibility and some of the challenges that I've found in that, things that we've um, made better by being a full-time accessibility person on Angular. I have a waffle. It's a cartoon waffle. If I giggle, it'll probably be because I'm looking at this image of a waffle, but this this image of the waffle actually marks an important concept in accessibility and in client rendered applications. So outside of just Angular apps, if you see the waffle, this is an important concept in accessibility and in client side web applications. We're also gonna talk about NG Aria, the accessibility module in Angular 1. And I'm the primary maintainer of that module. I'm working on some improvements for it. There are other people who contribute to it as well, but 
Uh, we'll talk about what NG Aria is and what it isn't and what it can do for you. We'll talk about Protractor, the end-to-end -end testing framework for Angular, and how you can use Protractor to test for accessibility in your applications. And then we'll touch a little bit on Angular 2, which is definitely, um, it was cool to see the talks this morning on Angular 2. The accessibility story in Angular is already better than it was in Angular 1. So I will touch on it a little bit, but primarily what we're going to focus on is Angular 1. And again, if you see the waffle, it means it's an important concept in accessibility. Material design. We've heard it mentioned a few times already today. I've been working on it for a while. Material design, the goal of it is to create a cohesive design language across all platforms. So there's an Android version. There's a Polymer um, implementation of material design. And the design specification is sort of the, the inspiration and the starting point that we use for Angular Material to say, how should form controls behave when a user interacts with them? Or what are common color palettes and typography and things that will make it cohesive across all platforms? So because Google is um, very committed to material design, obviously it made sense to make an Angular implementation. And there is more than one, but the official Angular uh, material implementation is Material Design for Angular. Um, it's at material.angularjs.org. That's the documentation website. Um, there's a rich community on GitHub. Lots of GitHub issues open um, and closed. There's some pull requests and a lot of community activity that makes it pretty battle tested. Um, it's a very um, comprehensive framework. Some of the key things in material design and in Angular that are important for accessibility, the first thing that we're going to talk about, you see the waffle, so this means this is an important topic. Uh, interactivity. Things that are interactive should be reachable from a keyboard. They should be usable from a screen reader. This ensures that people who have disabilities will still be able to interact with your app. Um, so I have a couple examples from Angular Material, including a toolbar, which I'm going to interact with, with it a little bit. So if I use the keyboard and I tab onto this toolbar, I can actually see my focus move onto it, and then I can hit um, different keys and from the keyboard. It's, this example is not actually um, is not wired up to do anything, but um, it's reachable from the keyboard. So my focus is on this button. And then I go to the next item, and it's a checkbox. It's pretty, it's a little bit small on my screen, but the, the checkbox, when I tab onto it, it has a, an ink circle that grows out from the center. And that's a style that you see in material design quite a bit. So as I move my, my focus around the page, I get feedback about where I am. And if I hit the space bar, I can toggle a checkbox or a switch on and off. So this ensures that people who rely on keyboards or screen readers will actually be able to use these controls. And this seems pretty basic, but surprisingly, this level of support is not common in every Angular material, or in every material design implementation. Either you won't get feedback from the keyboard, or you just won't be able to reach it at all from the keyboard. Because what happens as developers is we tend to design and develop for ourselves, and we forget that not everyone can use the trackpad, or not everyone can use the mouse. So we make it work with a hover state, and you click on it with a mouse, we think our job is done. I challenge you to look a little more, um, or try looking at it from a different perspective, and navigate your apps using a keyboard and a screen reader. So, and starting with the keyboard is the simplest thing. Furthermore, so that's the checkbox and switch example. The buttons are also reachable from the keyboard, and I get a little bit of um, color feedback. One thing I've pushed the material design team on a little bit is the color contrast of these. And it's probably, actually, this looks pretty good on the monitor. Um, on, on a less contrast monitor, or if you had a, a vision impairment of some kind, the level of contrast that we actually get as uh, the styles that are in the material design guidelines, they could be enhanced more. So that's something I'd hope to see a little bit in the future, um, because the color contrast that we currently have could pose problems for people who have vision impairments. But at least in the, in the interactive piece of this, every, 
every control or button is reachable from the keyboard. And we'll look a little bit at how we can actually make that work. Um, but then it's also, we can, we can do things from these controls. So I also have some radio buttons. Let me make sure I'm on the right item. Yes. So if I use the arrow keys through this uh, selection of radio buttons, I, they are essentially one control. So a checkbox is an isolated item. It will check or uncheck something. A group of radio buttons are mutually exclusive, and so you want to only select one. Um, so if you're using the keyboard, if you use the arrow keys, you should be able to toggle, a, you know, choose a single radio button. Semantics. Um, and actually, since we have a lot of time, um, I'm going to go back and look at what these actually look like. We'll look in the dev tools to see what makes these interactive. So the, um, let's look at the radio button example first. So the radio group is, um, is the item that we actually tab onto. And the important piece that I want you to look at here is the tab index. So by adding a tab index onto this item, because this isn't actually a native radio button, um, it is a Angular directive. And this is really common, so this is why I wanted to drill down into it and show it to you. Um, the MD radio group is the control that we set up in Angular Material to create radio buttons. To tab onto them, because an MD radio group is essentially a div, we add tab index of zero, and then you can actually reach this control. And then we use the same JavaScript to um, change between the items. Um, but the reachability with using tab index is what I wanted you to see. So the next big topic after interactivity, which you can always check if something's interactive just by using your keyboard. Um, but for screen readers and assistive technologies, it's really important that we use semantics. The problem is that in Angular and also in web components, we can now create custom elements. We can create our own named directives, and that's awesome. But we should know something about what that does to a screen reader. So in Angular Material, the HTML API for creating a button is MD button as an element. So in your, you know, in your tag name, you just say MD-button, and then put text in it. And then Angular Material will actually transclude that into a real button. This is important to understand that if you were an accessibility specialist and you looked at this, you'd say, wow, that MD button is not actually a button. Um, and it's important to know that we are actually making it into a button. And there's some uh, pros and cons of doing it in that way. But what I wanted you to, to see is the code that it actually renders at the end of this transclusion process, where it replaces the custom element name with a native button element. So this button element is reachable from the keyboard because buttons are native elements. They come with tab index. We don't actually need to add tab index onto a native element. It also will fire events from the keyboard. We don't have to do anything special. We can just put ng-click directly on um, a native button element. So by, by knowing that we are adding the semantic version, um, this, this can improve the accessibility of our applications. Going one step further, so the, the button element is a native element. Another example would be um, a, a native input. Things that you get a lot of accessibility for free because these controls were built to be form controls. But because we can create our own items, and a good example to take a closer look at this is the MD checkbox. And we already looked at the MD radio button group. Um, that was a custom element that we created that we are adding all of the accessibility back into. So it's actually a lot of work. And I, I would recommend starting with the native input. Because if we look at the example of the MD checkbox, to make this accessible, we have to add tab index. So we have tab index of 0. And what that does is it means that the, the order that your code appears in your document is the, order, the tab order that it will get if you use tab index of 0. Numbers higher than zero, you have to actually manage the tab order of everything, and that can be cumbersome. So I would recommend if you are creating a custom control, like a checkbox, you should add tab index of zero, and then it will be reachable. To actually say that this fancy div is not a div, but a checkbox, for a screen reader, we have to add a role. And the concept of a role is, you could think of it as, what does this thing do? 
So this empty checkbox, which is essentially a div, we can reach it now, but when the screen reader user tabs onto the checkbox, we want it to be announced as checkbox. So we can do that by adding a role of checkbox. And there's all different kinds of roles. Um, you know, there's a, a radio button role, and there's landmark roles, and really cool things in ARIA, which, if you're not familiar with ARIA, it stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And I have a resource at the end of my slides about using ARIA in HTML. Because it's important that we use it correctly. We can't just put any old thing into the role attribute. We can't make up roles. We can't just decide that it's the new data attribute. A role is, an ARIA is a standard. It has a set of approved attributes that we can add. So the role of checkbox is one of these reserved roles. And it, it essentially announces the thing as a checkbox. Um, the other thing that we need to add, because this is a fancy div, is the aria checked attribute. And so this will tell a screen reader whether the checkbox is checked or not. Um, you might be asking, well, why wouldn't I just use the checked attribute? The checked attribute by itself, um, it will only work on a native input. So if you had an input type of checkbox, you could just use the HTML5 checked attribute. But because this is md-checkbox and it's a custom tag name, we have to use ARIA. And what this does, um, this is a good example that is, it's an actual real life example of where we use ARIA. And the idea is that it's filling the gaps where this is a custom element and it doesn't have all that accessibility support. We can add the accessibility support by filling the gaps with ARIA. So the three main components of ARIA, um, if you're new to it, they are the roles, states, and properties. The role again is what does this thing do? The states are things like ARIA checked or ARIA disabled. Um, and then there's a catch-all bucket of properties um, of additional things. And I encourage you, if you're, if you're at this level, you should be reading up on an ARIA attribute when you go to use it. I, I typically will go and look at something. I'll, I'll say, I want to use ARIA checked. I'm going to go refresh my memory and make sure I'm using this correctly so that I know what the keyboard support should be for this thing. So what you would find for ARIA checked, for example, I'm creating a checkbox. And I'm going to go look at ARIA checked. And I will discover that the expected keyboard behavior is you tab onto the checkbox and you hit the space bar. We saw that in my demo earlier. So I hit the space bar. And it should enable and disable the checkbox. Um, and so that's the kinds of things that you should know. So another major area of accessibility and client rendered applications is the concept of a text alternative. How many of you have any idea what a text alternative is? A OK, so quite a few. It's kind of a. It's a term that once you know what it means, it's like, oh, OK, I get that. But I want to make sure that it's not just this jargony speak that doesn't make any sense. So a text alternative is text that a screen reader user can rely on to know what something is. Because if you're using an interface, and when we're designing things, design is not just visual. A text alternative is a way to tell a screen reader user what something is. So some code examples of how to create text alternatives. One really common example is to wrap text that should be for a screen reader, but doesn't need to be rendered or doesn't need to be visualized. Um, we can just wrap it in a span and add a CSS class. And there are differing methods for creating what's called visually hidden text. Visually hidden, um, the method we use in Angular Material is um, I think the same as the HTML5 boilerplate example. And these are utility classes that are totally OK to copy from other places. Um, and so the visually hidden class, it just, I think it clips the text and maybe reduces it to one pixel high. And it, like, there's this collection of things that the idea with visually hidden is that it actually renders the text, but you just don't see it. The old method was to jam it way off the screen using a left property and a position absolute. Um, I think the, the method for doing that has evolved. But the basic idea is that you're visually hiding the text inside of some other element. 
Another example of a text alternative would be the label for a form input. So if we, and this is super common to forget. Actually, I was just looking at the Angular 2 documentation, and this is an item that they forget. It's important that we actually label a checkbox or a radio button so a screen reader user will know what this control is for. Um, and I think in the beginning, we, we saw an image from a textbook. This is a very common thing. It the, was the problem in the textbook example, was that we forget a label. So to properly label an input, this is like HTML 101, and I'm really sorry that I have to tell you this, but we forget it often enough that it's worth reminding. Um, you just add the for attribute on a label element, um, match it to an input, and then they will be paired. Simple stuff. For a button, say you had a button that had an icon in it, and you wanted to have only the visual icon, but the text, this is very common, we, just, we don't want text, we just want the icon. One way to actually label something is to add the aria label attribute. Um, you could also use this on the input above if you didn't have a, an actual label that got rendered uh, or wasn't part of the design. You could add an aria label attribute and it would label something as well. And then lastly, you should add an alt attribute for any image that is, has content. And um, I have stop waffling and get on with it as my caption because I'm kind of waffling right now. This is <laughs> uh, going pretty awesome, you guys. <laughs> um, enforcing text alternatives. So I wanted to bring this up because in Angular Material, I saw, again, an opportunity to make a framework, a major framework, more accessible. So we added utilities into the framework to actually encourage best practices and to maybe remind you if you've forgotten to label something. I cannot tell you how many people ask me how to turn this thing off, because we all forget labels, apparently. So the example that I'm showing is the radio button. So in the Angular Material docs, there are a few different radio button examples in the demo. One of them is an icon, so you could choose between an avatar. The image by itself does not provide any text. So to label it, you have to go one step further. And Trying to be an accessible framework means that you have to remind someone when they forgot an important detail. This utility will log to the console that you forgot a, a label, that it'll point you to the node that you actually forgot the label on, and that way you can, it can help you go find it and track it down. Instead of just throwing you a warning and saying, hey, you forgot a label, it will actually point you to the specific node. And I find that's really important for actually fixing the thing. But a lot of people think that this is noise, and they don't think that accessibility is, like, they, it's just not a requirement for their app. Um, this is really important stuff, because we should be creating apps that everyone can use. And even if you're just creating a demo, or it's just something I'm hacking together, well, if you're just hacking it together, these warnings in the console shouldn't be a big deal. But if you're actually creating an app, that people will use. I challenge you to look at your audience and your assumptions about who you think your audience is. I, can, I bet you I could find an example of someone who would use your fitness app or your whiskey app or whatever the thing is that you're building. Chances are there's somebody using a screen reader who would need this text alternative. So this is just a practice that we could use to try and make um, more accessible apps that everyone, are, are, everyone who's using this framework could make a more accessible app. So to fix these warnings, instead of disabling the console like somebody thought they should do, to actually fix these warnings, um, for the example of the MD radio button, I have the source code without the label. So we can look at this and say, all right, it's repeating over some data. Um, it's showing that it's going to actually spit out a radio button for each item in the data set. Inside of the radio button is the MD icon directive which you can use to insert icons into things like buttons and toolbars and uh, radio buttons. But it's missing some sort of text. Either the icon needs it, because the icon is the, the thing, the content, either that could be labeled, or we can just add a label on the parent. Because the parent of the radio button is, is the actual control that needs the label. And so what this does, when we label it, it, it means that the screen reader user will actually know what, um, what this radio button is for, this particular radio button. 
So we can see there is no text at all. Um, there's a, just the icon inside of it. To actually fix this warning, just add aria label and then pull, pull content from that data set and then it will label the thing. Um, it's a pretty easy fix to make. I don't know why it, people don't just do it. Um, but because I get this question a lot, I thought I would show you how to actually fix this. So just add an aria label. It'll make everybody much happier. Another major concept in accessible Angular applications is the idea of focus management. And actually, this is true outside of Angular, um, as we can see by the waffle. Um, anytime you're rendering something on the client, say you have views, and when you update something, it will re-render the view. Imagine if you were focused on a form element that was in a section of your page that got re-rendered for some reason. Um, maybe you made a selection and your focus was on the item and it just it wipes out the focus. So if you're actually relying on a keyboard, it's super frustrating. If you're relying on a screen reader, it makes it completely unusable because you don't know where you were necessarily. So if it kicks you back to the top of the page, you have to tab all the way back in. Um, and that can make something pretty unusable. So in Angular Material, there are certain components that we add focus management into. And one of those is the side nav. And I'm actually going to show you a video of what this looks like. So let's start this over. So our focus starts at the top of the page. And as we, actually, I'm going to go full screen with this. OK. Starting the focus at the top of the page, there's a skip to content link that came up. And we hit that. The idea with the skip to content link is that it will skip us by this entire left side navigation, because it's sort of a pain to have to tab through every single item. So this is why skip links are so awesome, because if you're relying on a keyboard, you can just skip by everything. And it's pretty low overhead to add a skip link. So we have one in the, in the Angular material docs. So we hit that link. It will send our focus into the, main, the primary content area on the right. And again, it's, I'm, I'm having to really explain a lot of this stuff because the color contrast is not quite high enough. So I want to point out to you where our focus is. So now we're in the, the um, it kicked us over to the, the toolbar. As we open this side nav, the, direct, the component actually has focus management built in. So what it will do by default, let's play this again. As you open the side nav, the default in this component is it will just focus on the, the wrapper of the side nav. Um, as a framework, you don't necessarily always want to send focus to the wrapping item. We had a lot of requests for, you know, I need to focus on a specific thing. Not that people wanted to disable it completely, but that they wanted to customize it to their liking. Um, and so we added support for sending focus to arbitrary items. And we'll watch this one more time. So you can see the, we hit the toggle button, it opens the side nav, it sends your focus into it, and then when we close the side nav by hitting the escape key or clicking on the button outside of it, it will send focus back to the item that triggered it. So the idea is that your focus is being sent back and forth, and we're managing it for you. And anytime you're writing an app that's client rendered at all, either it's React or Ember, um, or spine, or backbone, any of these things, this is an important concept. So the code for the side nav. Um, the actual component for the side nav is md-side nav. And then inside of it, you can put any combination of child directives that you want. You can nest other things inside of it. For example, the, um, the input, the text input in Angular Material. The API for this is the MD input container. And then inside of it, you could put a label, you could put a form input. Um, the thing I want to call your attention to is this child directive that we created to make it so you can arbitrarily focus on whatever you want. The side nav will go and look for the MD side nav focus child directive. When it finds that, it will send focus there instead of the wrapping element. And this is a pattern that I think we, we need to add it to dialogues. Um, any other component that we manage focus uh, by default, we have to make it a little more um, customizable. Because something I've found is that 
there are infinite use cases for each of these components and infinite combinations of components. And the size of the Angular Material GitHub repository will highlight that. Um, but it's really cool to see how people actually want to use focus management. Not just that, like, oh, that's cool, it does it for you, but, oh, I have this specific use case that all of a sudden, now that this is an option, people are thinking about how they could send focus to their components. So, um, yeah, the side nav does it. The, I think the dialogue, it, it has focus management, but it's not as customizable quite, quite yet. So another concept in Angular Material, or in, in accessibility of Angular, is notifying the user. So we've seen interactivity, we've seen semantics, um, focus management. Notifying the user is another thing that's actually an advantage in client-side applications, is that we can say you're typing in a form, and you have some error messaging, and you're, but you're focused on an item. You don't want to send somebody's focus off to an alert message, because that could be jarring, it could be confusing. So we need some sort of web mechanism to announce changes when something is happening, either error messaging or maybe you're filtering a list and you, you want to keep the user's focus somewhere, but you want to announce, hey, you filtered a list, there's 13 matches, or something like that. So this concept of notifying the user is important in client rendered applications for accessibility. And a pattern where we use this in Angular Material is the autocomplete. So the, the tag name is md-autocomplete. And what, you, what it does essentially is insert an input tag. And then you can wire it up to any data source, either local or remote. And it will add a list of things that you can, as you type, filter. Um, so pretty important that, A, it announced that there are options, but then as you type, it filters more and announces more things. So like a common example would be a list of states or, I mean, we have demos for the autocomplete, but um, the one I have on the screen is a list of states. So I type W, um, there are four matches, and then as I type another letter, it will filter them more. The code for this and the concept of notifying the user, we're relying on something called ARIA Live. And this is another part of this ARIA standard. And it's a pretty big concept. Um, but it's super cool that you can add a role of status. There's also the role of alert. Um, and the, in the levels of ARIA Live, there's assertive and polite. And so it's important to know what these differences are. Because sometimes we, we have to choose which level depending on what the user interaction should be. So an, an assertive alert would be something like a big error, like um, something that you need to announce immediately would use the assertive role. But if it's something that maybe could wait until whatever the user is doing, then you can use this passive or polite role. Um, for an autocomplete, you're in the middle of typing, you kind of need it to tell you in that second what the error is, so you can actually tie them, the two together. If the filter um, announcement waited until everything was done, we would not actually know what, what it was announcing. So for filtering a list of states, we need immediate feedback. So we use the alert role or the assertive uh, setting. So for the autocomplete, to actually announce these changes, um, we have a sort of a hidden child directive called the ARIA status. And this directive, um, it, technically, it is rendered. So if you put display none on it, it will not announce to the screen reader. It has to be present when the page loads. So these are some things that you should know. Any, the things that have the ARIA live um, roles and properties on them have to actually be present. And then the idea is that you just append messages to this element, and it becomes a message center that when a user has a screen reader running, it will just announce these changes. So the autocomplete, um, there's two parts to it. The, the HTML that gets inserted by the controller of the autocomplete, and then there's the, the switch in the, um, in the JavaScript for the controller. It will append messages to this thing. And as they appear and disappear, it will actually just pipe them to the screen reader. So to notify the user, you use ARIA Live. It's worth pointing out that Angular loves open source. And the Angular 1 repository is huge. Uh, the Angular Material repository is huge. 
Um, Angular 2 is also obviously on, on GitHub, but you can go and contribute. You can go and file issues and say, hey, this component in Angular Material is, could be better on Android or whatever, whatever your use case is. They love having that input. Part of this culture uh, created ng-aria, and ng-aria is um, a module that was created to do some heavy lifting for accessibility stuff where the framework should just really handle it for you. Like if you're using ng-disabled, you shouldn't also have to go and manage the aria for that. So ng-aria does that for you. It's been in the framework since Angular 1.3, but there's nothing really uh, critical that requires that you use Angular 1.3. Like, if you're using Angular 1.2, you could pull in ng-aria as a module dependency, and it would be fine. Um, but there's some good documentation on it online um, on the doc Angular Docs website. To include ng-aria, you just include it as a dependency. And then there's actually a configuration object where you can turn things on and off. You could say, I don't want tab index. I'm going to manage that. Um, and you can just set it to false in the config object. And you just include it as a dependency right next to Angular in your scripts. ng-aria adds support to a few choice directives, including ng-model, ng-disabled, ng-show, ng-hide, ng-click, ng-double-click, and ng-messages. And um, there's some improvements to this coming in the future. Um, but this does some stuff that makes it pretty useful um, as, a, as a dependency. For example, ng-disabled. As I mentioned, it would be kind of a pain to use ng-disabled, but then also have to manage aria-disabled. What this does, similar to the, uh, the checked example, how I mentioned the checked attribute only works on a native input, disabled is the same situation. So it will only actually disable a native input. If you're using an MD checkbox or fancy div or some custom element, to actually disable it in a screen reader, you have to use ARIA. And that will, for an accessibility API, that will actually disable the thing. So ng-aria, when you use ng-disabled, it will just spit out ARIA disabled and update it as that condition changes. So that's a pretty useful example. ng-click. This is one of the bigger things that ARIA tried to fix. Um, and it does do a pretty good job. The thing that it's trying to fix is ng-click on a div. Um, and it's technically, you could add a click event to a div in native JavaScript. But for some reason, this became really popular in Angular. And I think it's because they didn't discourage it. Um, and I have a div with an ng-click on it. Uh, the method it's calling is, oh, no, you didn't, because please don't do this. <laughs> because let's look at what ng-aria has to do to fix this. So the problem with this, we have a div. We have ng-click. Remember what we were talking about with the interactivity and the semantics stuff earlier? Um, having to add tab index to this, obviously that doesn't have tab index. Uh, this doesn't have a key press event on it because the click does not fire on a div. Um, that's the same with native um, JavaScript and HTML. This should be a button element, but it's a div. And this happens. So as a um, maintainer of ng-aria, I looked at the landscape and said, what could ng-aria do that would actually improve accessibility of web apps? With all, the only thing people would have to do is add this dependency. Well, this ng-click situation is a pretty big one. And I came in all excited and optimistic, and then I learned how hairy this is. Because every browser handles this differently. And so, I am proud to say I introduced my first bug into a major framework with ng-aria. It is now fixed, <laughs> but there is a section of ng-aria where it would, because what we did to fix it, we add the tab index. And actually, that's already being added by ng-model. Um, if you're using that, it will also add it with ng-click. But it added this tab index, but you still had to go and add ng-keypress alongside ng-click. So, to fix that, we, under the hood, if you add ng-click onto a div, we will also bind the key press event. And it will fire, like if you're using the keyboard, it will actually fire off your callback functions. Um, one step further, we went and added the button role, which is, is a bit controversial, because you might be intentionally using ng-click in some way. Um, and so this tried to fix it for like the majority of use cases, but obviously you might be totally knowledgeable about accessibility and be 
doing this for the right reasons, and so this might make you a little uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but the idea is that we can make these clicked divs more accessible just by adding ng-aria. Um, the bug that I mentioned was that we didn't actually check whether the element that had ng-click on it was um, a native control or not. So if it was a button which actually does have the key press event, it would fire two, two callback functions. So that was fun. That was a good, good time and something I introduced in Angular. It is now fixed. And I learned a lot about um, what, this, what it should do, um, how this kind of stuff happens in browsers, knowing that a button element actually fires a click. Um, I didn't, had never looked that closely at the click event. Um, so this is a utility that really just use a button. And then we wouldn't have to do stuff like this. Um, I wouldn't have to come and write a module that tries to fix accessibility on the web because you just use a button uh, and everything would be a lot better. So we see the waffle again. This is a big thing. Like, use semantic markup. Use buttons. Because the amount of work that you and I will have to do to make the web more accessible will be much less. OK, Protractor. It's actually taking a lot more time than I thought. Um, Protractor, quickly, is a Node.js command line application. Um, it runs on Selenium WebDriver. You can choose which test framework you want, um, and it's great for continuous integration if you want to prevent inaccessible stuff from making it out into the world. I wrote a plugin for Protractor that you can use to test your site with the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools, which is an open source library, and Tenon.io, which is a, an accessibility API. Um, it will run each test that you write. It will run your code against these utilities and tell you if you have problems. The setup for the Protractor Accessibility plugin, um, you can, it comes with the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools library, pulls it down as an NPM module, um, and then you can just add this flag of true or false to enable it. Ten and IO is, like both of these are optional, but the Ten and IO option is more robust. It requires um, an API key and an account. The Chrome version is free, which I have a, um, a little, um, graph in my slides about like, should I, which one can I use. Um, the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools is free. It runs locally on your machine so your code won't grow legs. Um, the Tenon version is more robust, um, and they have actually gotten rid of their free limited accounts now. Um, but if you were actually testing for accessibility compliance, Tenon would give you way more peace of mind and more test coverage. So you might say, well, why would I use Tenon? It's because it's a more robust um, set of tests. Some testing strategies. You could check for labels. So you could check for things like the radio button example. Um, you could validate that you've used the correct aria role uh, or the correct attribute, because it's actually just role. It's not aria dash role, it's just role. And these are really easy mistakes, though. Like, I've made that mistake. I've said, you know, role of image and wrote IMAGE instead of IMG. It's kind of my example that I always go to because I've made that mistake. So if you automate your testing, it will just find this stuff for you. It can find wa watched ARIA properties to make sure that they update at the right time. It can test your interactions and make sure that you have tab index or that things are reachable. Um, and then lastly, you could check color contrast, which is um, a thing that needs to improve in material design. Quickly, some Angular 2, uh, which we heard already today a little bit about. Um, some of the biggest changes for the user interaction side, which um, I'm definitely more in the um, user engineering side, or UX engineering, um, there's no more de directive definition object. It's more web components based. Um, you're binding directly to properties and not attributes. So for things like um, user interaction, these syntax changes are pretty uh, important. There's no more JQ Lite DOM wrapper because we don't need it. The web APIs have gotten a lot better in the last five years. And then ES6 modules, which don't really have much to do with inter user interaction. They're just cool. The event bindings. We used to do ng focus and ng click, um, and then you know, use interpolation inside of attributes um, on the native button, for example. Now we just, instead of the ng focus, you bind the event using parentheses. And then um, as we, this is actually kind of an evolution happening with Angular 2 right now, is the prefixing of um, properties. It's not a good idea to just 
pollute your app with um, unnamed, unnamespaced properties. Um, I have an example of waffle ID. Um, whether you would actually prefix the ID um, property, um, I, I need to actually go and check. But if you had some arbitrary property that you were using, you would want to prefix it with something. And there's a really cool discussion on GitHub about the decisions they're making in Angular 2. And you can go and participate. Um, it's pretty cool. Angular 2 includes ARIA support. So we don't need ng ARIA in Angular 2. Um, they're doing a lot more now to actually include it from the start. And so that's pretty cool. We don't need a Band-Aid thing like ng ARIA to come and fix it. Um, so I'm excited to see how this evolves in the future. Again, you can contribute to Angular 2 on GitHub. Um, there are accessibility issues open and conversations going about you know, modal dialogues, things that need input. Like They need to be reminded of focus management and semantics and all of these things. I think there already is a conversation going. Um, but I wanted, what I wanted to tell you is that you can participate if you aren't already. To wrap things up, I have some resources in my slides, including using ARIA in HTML. This is pretty important for if you're writing these custom directives, um, like MD checkbox. You should know what, what are the rules of ARIA. The Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools, both the uh, browser extension and the audit library. Um, I just gave a talk on automated accessibility testing at JSConf, and that was all about that side of things, a little bit about the protractor stuff and so on. There is an official Angular blog post from back in November about ng ARIA and what, it, what the goals of it were and kind of understanding where to get started. Um, I have um, the documentation for the Protractor Accessibility plugin, uh, which I would highly recommend using because that's just an NPM install. That's super easy to pull into your app. Um, if you're curious to know more about um, the intricacies of accessibility in Angular, um, my colleague Dylan Burrell did a really good series on the Accessible To Do MVC application, which is the canonical client rendered application example, but they don't always have the best accessibility. So that was a good one. And then lastly, um, I have a post about how to audit a website for accessibility. If you're like, all right, that's cool. That was, she talked at us for 45 minutes. What do I do next? that might be a good place to get started. That's it. Question? I did create the waffle, yes. And it made me giggle. <laughs> the, the waffle is square, and he has googly eyes. Like I literally searched googly eyes, and that's the eyes. It kind of has like a SpongeBob face. So yes, I did create the waffle. But if you have any legitimate accessibility questions, I'm, I can answer those too. <laughs> sure. The question was about keyboard shortcuts. I think that would be awesome, um, as long as they work with screen readers, which have their own keyboard shortcuts. Um, I think uh, I didn't go into it um, in this talk, but there is the concept of a virtual cursor in a screen reader where um, there's a, basically a barrier between the user with the screen reader and the actual web browser where the screen reader will catch input. So like, if I want to hit the H key to skip around to headings, that's a reserved shortcut for a screen reader. So it might be something to think about. But anything you can do to make keyboard accessibility better, thumbs up for me. Mm -hmm.